Okay, good evening, uh, dear students. So uh, today uh, in the functional materials portion, we will be covering a little bit on materials for heterogeneous catalysis. So on this, uh, the things what we will cover is renewable energy and renewable fuels. We'll talk a little bit about the basic principles of catalysis, then catalysts for conversion of biomass derived feedstocks into fuel components. Then we will discuss electrocatalysts for water electrolysis. Then we will talk about electrocatalysts for carbon dioxide reduction, which is a very hot topic nowadays, and then photocatalysts for water electrolysis. So uh, let's start with uh, renewable energy. Currently, uh, there is a lot of discussion on sustainability of the planet and all the processes. What you need to uh, you need to do is it should be you know sustainable. So here, renewable energy is going to play a very important role. And renewable energy is what? It is basically energy from sources that are naturally replenishing, but it is flow limited. So renewable resources are virtually inexhaustible in duration, but limited in the amount of energy that is available per unit of time. So major types of renewable energy sources, as we all know, are wind, solar, hydropower, hydrogen, geothermal, ocean, biomass. And in biomass, uh, we have wood and wood waste, municipal solid waste, landfill gas and biogas, ethanol and biodiesel. So all these different types of renewable energy sources, if you see, they definitely they are inexhaustible, but they have intermittent supply. So sometimes the wind is blowing, sometimes it's not, sun is shining on some parts, and then in some parts it's cloudy or you are not getting that much amount of solar energy. So all these things are kind of, it's not that you are having the same amount at, the, uh, it, at all possible times. It will be, you know, in higher amounts in a little short burst of time, and then again there will be dry spells. So that is one of the uh, obstacles in using renewable energy sources and harnessing the renewable energy definitely requires a lot of science and technology. So what, why do we need renewable energy? Because this is a very common slide. Uh, carbon dioxide is at 407 ppm and it is increased by 90 ppm in the last 70 years. You have a global warming which is going up at the rate of 1.1 degrees centigrade in the past 200 years. Ocean acidification is happening. You are having rising sea level. It's rising to the extent of 3.2 millimeters each year. Then you have a decreasing ice sheet mass, retreating glaciers, decreasing Arctic ice at the rate of 13% each decade. So renewable energy is crucial for mitigating climate change. Why? Because all these things are happening because the atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing. So the carbon dioxide which is present in the atmosphere is increasing and it is giving, giving rise to all these different changes. So now coming into these different types of renewable energy, so in wind energy, uh, the wind farms you have, the amount of power which you get from the wind and therefore the electricity of wind turbine, it can produce, is, it is based on the wind velocity and how it is uh, applicable, how, how it is related to the wind velocity is by this particular equation you see over here, where you have the dependence on a larger wind turbine, that is the area and you have higher wind speed or lots of power. So rho is nothing but the air density. A, a is the swept area, which is basically the, if you have a larger wind blade or larger wind turbine, it will give you more power. And of course, it is dependent on the velocity of the wind. And this power is measured in watts. Solar energy, how it works? Thermal solar panels, they are generally used to generate the heat energy. Then photovoltaic cells, they are made from silicon. They turn the sunlight directly into electricity. And 10.7% of total electricity generated by solar, uh, these photovoltaic cells in India, uh, it was in 2020, you have around 10.7% of the total electricity which was generated by using the solar PV. And if you consider the renewables in total, that is total of wind, solar, hydropower, and all those other the different renewable energy sources I mentioned, out of which solar was having around 37%, which has increased to around 42% in the last two years. So in geothermal, how it works, geothermal energy is basically heat energy from the earth. So decay of these radioactive elements and residual heat from the planetary formation 4.5 billion years ago almost, that is how this heat has been generated, geothermal energy is generated. So how you extract the energy, water is pumped down into the hot rock where it gets heated. And then steam can be used to heat the buildings directly or you can use it to you know, generate electricity by spinning a turbine. So this is how it works. So you are actually forcing in uh, the water over here. It is moving into this heated rocks. It's getting heated. It is generating the steam. And this is how it works, the geothermal energy, how it is extracted. 
And hydroelectric power is one of the most oldest form of renewable energy. It has been harnessed. So hydroelectric power harnesses what? The kinetic energy of running water. Water flows downwards with gravity and then it spins a turbine. And it is definitely more reliable than solar and wind power because you are kind of switching it on and switching it off. So hydroelectric dams, however, they are very expensive and we all know they can harm wildlife. So obviously, uh, a lot of uh, human related issues, I mean, he, um, they, they are associated with hydroelectric power. So currently in India, we have around 12.3% of electricity, which is uh, generated from the hydroelectric schemes, which is around again 37% of the renewables in total. So uh, then coming to the last form of, bio, uh, of the uh, renewables energy, which we'll discuss is the biomass. These are renewable energy sources, which is coming from biological materials, such as plants, animals, microorganisms, and municipal waste. So in any kind of this biomass, what you have are this cellulose microfibrils. You have a thing which is attaching these microfibrils to each other, which is known as lignin. And you have these different cellulose bundles and you have hemicellulose, which are attached to the uh, to the cellulose bundles. So these are the different components of biomass. So uh, you have different types of bioenergy, one of which is biofuels, which is renewable energy, which is derived from microbial plant or animal materials out of which you can have liquids in the form of methanol, ethanol, butanol, and biodiesel. And otherwise you can have gases like methane and hydrogen. Also another type of bioenergy is bioheat, which is generally obtained by burning of the biomass, like burning wood. Then you also have something known as bioelectricity, which is combustion in a boiler to the turbine, or you can have microbial fuel cells, which we will discuss a little bit in details. So what are the different conversion process you're having? You can have biological conversion, so where fermentation can take place and you can, uh, lead, it leads to the formation of methanol, ethanol, butanol, or you can have anaerobic digestion, and this gives rise to methane gas, or you can have anaerobic respiration, which is basically how bio batteries work. Then you can have chemical conversion, which is the transit esterification process. And this is the process through which you generate something which is known as biodiesel. And you can have, of course, thermal conver uh, conversion, which has been uh, used, uh, you know, millions of years ago, combustion, gasification, pyrolysis. So these are all the thermal conversion processes. So now biomass to bioenergy route, this is a very uh, interesting slide. So you have over here on the left hand side, this is the photosynthesis. Out of photosynthesis, biomass is taking in energy from the sun. Then you have these different conversion processes. And this ultimately gives rise to biofuels and bioenergy and then their various applications. Now, if you look down, what you find is the photosynthesis process, which is given over here. Among the biomass, you have different kinds of biomass. You can have wet biomass like organic waste and manures. Then you can have solid biomass, wood, straw. Then sugar and starch plants, they, like sugar canes and cereals, they can be another kind of biomass. You have the sugar cane bagasse, which is being used a lot for this generation of energy, production of energy from biomass. Then you have different oil crops and algae, like sunflower and soybean. Once you have taken out the entire oil and the uh, soybean, all the other important parts are gone, then whatever is left can be used to generate this kind of biofuels and bioenergy. So what are the different conversion processes you can have? You can have anaerobic fermentation, of wet biomass, which will give you biogas like hydrogen and methane. You can have gasification, combustion, pyrolysis and hydrolysis of solid biomass. And it gives rise to fuel gas and pyrolytic oil, in some cases even sugar. And all of this can be used to generate heat, electricity, in some cases liquid biofuels. Sugar and starch, you can use hydrolysis and extraction process to give you sugar, which can again be fermented and it gives you ethanol and butanol, which is again liquid biofuel. Or from oil crops and algae, as I said, using sunflower and soybean and all stuff, you can do crushing, refining, you get pure oil. And then you can form by the trans esterification process, you can form methyl esters, which are nothing but biodiesel. And these are again liquid biofuels. So these can be used for transport. Whereas all the other forms which you are having of biofuels, you can use it for, to generate electricity, heat, and for different kinds of applications, so on and so forth. And ultimately, this gives rise to uh, the emission of carbon dioxide, but definitely, uh, though it gives rise to, I mean, obviously when you are using it for all these applications, it gives to carbon dioxide, but you have to remember that it is coming from a process uh, which definitely is uh, much more sustainable compared to using fossil fuels. So what are the advantages of biomass? You have widespread availability in many parts of the world. You have contribution uh, to the security of energy supplies. Then generally low fuel cost compared to fossil fuels, obviously, but then uh, when you are actually processing, it might be it might be a little more costly compared to that of fossil fuels. Biomass as a resource, it can be stored in large amounts and bioenergy can be produced on demand. 
then you can have uh, you know because of this a use of biomass to this kind of energy you can create jobs then you can develop technologies and knowledge base which offer opportunities for technology exports then carbon dioxide mitigation and other emission reductions like uh, for the sulfur oxides etc so all these are the different advantages of using biomass what are the environmental benefits suppose you are using gasoline or petroleum as a fuel and you are generating greenhouse gas if you are switching over to something like corn ethanol which is a biomass and uh, uh, which basically it, it can give you natural gas or it can give biomass it can almost you can go up to reduction of 52% of this carbon dioxide emission and you go even further if you use sugar cane ethanol sugar, the ethanol which is coming from sugar cane in that case you have around 78% reduction of the greenhouse gas and when, uh, greenhouse carbon dioxide gas and whereas when you are using cellulosic ethanol which is another biomass you have almost 86% reduction so these are all the different environmental benefits you have when you are using these different kinds of biomass for production of energy but all definitely uh, i mean everything which has a good point sometimes it also has some drawbacks and uh, one of the drawbacks is you have a very low energy content in biomass the energy density is very low then you obviously for biomass you have a competition for resource with food and material applications like particle board or paper if you are using wood and burning wood so all these different applications uh, of course you are impacting those industries then generally this is very important there's a higher investment cost for conversion into final energy in comparison with the fossil alternatives so obviously research is going on like how you can bring down this investment cost and you can have a most cost effective way of transforming this biomass to energy so what are the different biofuel applications in case of liquids ethanol and butanol these can be used in the gasoline engines or which petroleum engines either as a low blend up to 10% or in high blends in flexible fuel vehicles or in the pure form in adapted engines and biodiesel which is the methyl ester which uh, it can be used in both blended with the fossil diesel or in pure form and gra gradually the acceptance by the car manufacturers for this biodiesel is definitely increasing so but why butanol why butanol is generally considered when you are talking about biomass to fuel because it is more similar to gasoline than ethanol and butanol has a big advantage that it can be transported by existing pipelines whereas you cannot really transport ethanol like that and fuel energy is designed for use with gasoline uh, it can be used also for uh, butanol uh, without any kind of modification so and uh, uh, you can produce it from biomass you can also produce it from petroleum which is also petro butyl uh, butanol uh, uh, toxicity issue if we talk about whatever toxicity is there in gasoline the same is there in butanol so in this bio butanol so that is not really much different now how do you get biodiesel from triglyceride oils so triglycerides they consist of glycerol backbone and three fatty acid tails as you know as you can see over here it's given here pictorially so now uh, you have a catalyst which is uh, the sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide and they facilitate the breaking of the bonds between the fatty acids and the glycerol and the methanol will then combine to the free end of the fatty acid and it produces a methyl ester as you can see over here and this is biodiesel but you have to remember this is a multi step reaction mechanism it moves from triglyceride to di to mono and then methyl esters and glycerin that is what is formed so this is how you generate biodiesel from the triglyceride oils which is which is what you obtain using your sunflower and you know all these different algae oil so what are the applications of biofuels hydrogen uh, can be used in the fuel cells for generating electricity and methane uh, can be combusted directly or converted to ethanol so these are the different gaseous kind of biofuels which find lot of application bioheat what are the applications small scale heating you know that burning a wood fire and cooking and then for heating purposes so those are all small scale heating systems then you have medium scale users typically are burning wood chips in the great boilers or you can have large scale boilers which burn a large variety of fuels wood waste refuse derived fuels so all those things so these are the biomass boilers which you have these are used for generally heating applications not very important in a country like ours which is uh, somewhere near the uh, subtropics but uh, it, it is definitely much more useful in the countries where heat is definitely needed almost 6 to 7 months per year then you have bioelectricity applications so uh, this is combustion followed by a water vapor cycle so bioelectricity how it is generated the first you are combusting the biomass and then whatever heat is generated with that you are actually uh, evaporating water and that water vapor cycle is driving a turbine and uh, that is how you are generating the electricity and in another case what you have is microbial fuel cells where directly you are converting the biomass to electricity 
So how does the microbial fuel cell work? So you have this uh, uh, this uh, microbial fuel cell where uh, you the electrons will flow here, as you can see from the anode, through a resistor it is flowing to the cathode where electron acceptors are produced, as you can see over here, all the electron acceptors. And the protons which are generated, they will flow across a proton exchange membrane and it will complete the circuit. So this is how a microbial fuel cell it works. So there are two compartments, one is a proton exchange membrane and then you have a nafion or altrix which is basically the proton exchange membrane which is used. Electrodes are generally the graphite plate and working volume for these microbial fuel cells which are used in the lab are typically around 400 ml. So this is how a microbial fuel cell generally looks. Now, obviously biomass converting to, you know, renewable fuels and chemicals so one thing is very important is the catalytic conversion and this is why we are talking about materials for heterogeneous catalysis. So uh, one of the important points in these kind of research is designing more active, selective and stable catalyst and elucidating a more detailed understanding of the catalytic chemistries which are underlying these processes. So what is catalysis? Catalyst is an action by catalyst which takes part in a chemical reaction process, alters the rate of the reaction and yet itself it will return to the original form without being consumed or destroyed at the end of the reactions. So if you have an uncatalyzed reaction which goes from the reactants via this kind of activation energy to the product, if you're using a catalyst, your reactants and product energy level is not changed but what changes is basically the activation energy. So this is where your catalyst function and we all know that. So what are the three key aspects of catalyst action? It will take part in the reaction. It will change itself during the process by interacting with other reactant product molecules. It will alter the rate of the reaction. Most cases it increases the rate, but there are few cases where basically it hinders the rate of the, uh, you know, the, the side reactions. And then of course the catalyst will again return to its original form. So after reaction cycles, a catalyst with exactly the same nature you can say is almost reborn. So uh, you can say that catalyst is not getting destroyed, not being produced, but the thing is that in practice, a catalyst has its lifespan. It deactivates gradually as you're using it. The cycles may be more, very, 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 you know, the large number of cycles it might work, but ultimately it definitely has a lifespan. So uh, what is the catalysis action? It basically uh, deals with the reaction kinetics and mechanism. So catalyst action, it leads to a change in the rate of reaction. And this, how it is done, is uh, basically by uh, forming complex with the reactants and products, controlling the rate of elementary steps in the process. And uh, how you have, uh, how we can actually say that it controls the rate of elementary steps in the process because the reaction activation energy gets altered. Intermediate form, they are different from those which are formed in case of a non catalyzed reaction. And the rates of the reactions are altered, both the desired as well as the undesired ones. So, reaction proceeds under less demanding conditions. And so a catalyst, it allows reaction to occur under milder conditions, maybe at lower temperature uh, than, um, and this is very advantageous for all these heat sensitive kind of uh, materials. So you have to remember that catalyst, it does not vary the delta G or the equivalent constant values of the reaction. It merely changes the pace of the process. So uh, what is happening, suppose you have this particular reaction at one particular temperature around 373K, you will find that the delta G value is 151 kilojoules per mole. Whereas if you increase the temperature, then this delta G value goes down, it goes to minus 16. So the thermodynamic driving force is there at 700 degrees centigrade. So if you are doing the temperature at around 973K or 700 degrees centigrade, thermodynamic driving force for this particular reaction is there. But if you are simply putting in the methane and carbon dioxide in the reactor, it doesn't mean it will react. So it needs a proper catalyst heating the mixture in reactor. And when you are having these kind of catalysts present in the reactor at the same temperature, then you can have this kind of conversion happening. Just merely by putting it and heating, probably it will not work. You have to put in the catalyst also. So there are five broad classes of catalysis research. So one is biocatalysts, which are which we find in all uh, in many of these life systems, which are all our enzymes. Then you have homogeneous catalysis, mostly transition metal complexes, and these are used for fine chemicals and olefin metathesis. Then you have electrocatalysts, mostly these are platinum nanoparticles, and this you find a lot of application in fuel cells and in water electrolysis. Then the fourth type is conventional heterogeneous catalysis. You have all the rhodium nanoparticles and stuff like that. These are used in catalytic converters in ammonia synthesis. And then you have something which is known as ultra high vacuum surface science using, uh, you know, very, very well directed ruthenium catalysts. So these are used for fundamental studies for adsorption, desorption, these kind of reactions. 
So these are the five broad classes of catalysis research. So what are the catalyst composition? If you are talking about a solid catalyst, you have an active phase, then you have a promoter. A uh, promoter is a textual promoter or an electric or a structure modifier or you can have poison resistant promoters. And then you have a support or carrier. What does a support and carrier do? It will increase the mechanical strength of your catalyst. It will increase the surface area and it may or may not be cat uh, catalytically active. It's not important for the support and the carrier to be catalytically active. Most of the time it just produces the mechanical strength to the material. The active phase is where the reaction occurs and mostly these catalysts are either metals or metal oxides. So which are some of the common solid support or the carrier materials you'll find? You, will, you can have alumina, you can have silica, you can have uh, zeolites and there are other supports also. There can be active carbon, titania, zirconia, magnesia, lanthanum uh, oxides and these kind of things. So um, what are those active sites? So you can have these kind of porous solid with a pore and on the pore you can have you know all these different uh, metal oxides which are kind of dispersed and these are nothing but your active sites in the catalyst. So uh, you can prepare these catalysts using different kinds of uh, techniques. You can use precipitation technique, you can do adsorption and ion exchange, you can have impregnation happening. So you fill the pores of the support with a metal salt solution of sufficient concentration to give them a correct loading. Or you can have dry mixing, you can physically mix them, grind them, fire them. So these are the different methods by which you can prepare all these different solid catalysts. So catalyst, you remember, it needs to be calcined or fired in order to decompose the precursor and to acquire desired st thermal stability. The effect of calcination temperature and time are shown in these figures, as you can see over here, the temperature and time, how uh, the pretreatment is done for a particular catalyst. Uh, and some of the catalysts, you know, even after when you prepare it by a, pre uh, mostly the metals are prepared using reduction techniques. Then if you are having a metal sulfide as a catalyst, then you do sulfidation. In many cases, the catalyst will require, you know, activation. Some kind of, uh, some kind of activation step has to be done to, you know, get, derive the best performance out of your catalyst. And typical catalyst lifespan, it can be for uh, many years and few minutes, depending on the type of material you, you are using and the type of reaction for it, it is catalyzing. So you have this kind of thing. So generally, uh, in some cases, you know, in the active activation phase, what happens is the activity kind of decreases and then it re reaches a constant. In some cases for the activation phase, what happens is from the lower activity, it goes to a little higher activity, then it stays stable for a certain amount of time and then it starts dropping. So once the, once the catalytic activity starts dropping, then we call it as a dead phase. So we have till the time it is constant, the catalytic activity is constant, you consider that this is basically the productive lifespan of a catalyst. Now why is catalyst considered to be a green chemistry? Because using catalyst reduces energy consumption, uh, it, uh, uh, it promotes the use of stoichiometric reagents, byproducts are kind of reduced and it generates less of waste. So recalling the principles of green chemistry, it is better to prevent waste than to treat or clean up waste after it is formed, so that is satisfied by a catalyst. Then energy requirements should be minimized, which is also satisfied by a catalyst. And catalytic reagents are superior to the stoichiometric reagents. So that is also, so these kind of things are also supported by catalysts. That is why catalyst chemistry is known as a green chemistry. So, but what are the disadvantages? Uh, sometimes separation of the catalyst residues from products becomes a very, very involved process. Recycling of the catalyst, how much you can recycle, that also matters. Uh, then degradation of the catalyst, catalyst you're using and it's getting degraded very fast and that also again removing that kind of impurity also a lot of energy is wasted in that. Then of course toxicity of the catalyst or catalyst residues or the catalytic degradation products. So these are a few disadvantages of catalyst but so much amount of work is being done that all these disadvantages are getting reduced by leaps and bounds every uh, day. So in general it is greener to use catalyst than not to use them. That is the take home message from here. So a few case studies I'm giving, suppose you, are, you want to synthesize ibuprofen, you know how important it is and huh? it's such an important pain relieving drug. So if you see the different steps which are used, there are quite a few steps, you need not know it, but see the number of steps which are there. Whereas if you're doing this whole synthesis of ibuprofen, you're using, you know, catalysts like nickel and you're using palladium catalyst. And then what happens is you see that the number of steps is reduced, less waste is generated, and you are having 99% conversion with 96% selectivity. So all these three steps, whatever you are using, you are having uh, catalytic steps. And so definitely your number of steps is reduced, your much less waste is generated. 
Now, what are the different definitions of catalysis? You have something which is known as homogeneous catalysis. So here, the reagents and catalysts will all be in same phase, and typically all are in solution. You can have heterogeneous catalysis, so there is surface catalysis occurs. So reagents in this case are in different phase from the catalyst. Usually the reagents are gases or liquids and they are passed over a solid catalyst. Example, catalytic converters in case of car exhaust, this is how the gas is actually passing over a solid uh, catalyst. And biocatalysts, we are using enzymes to catalyze a particular reaction, which I discussed in a few slides earlier. So what are the general features for heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysts? So these green ticks are basically what are advantages, the crosses are which are the uh, disadvantages. So in heterogeneous Catalysts, what are the advantages? They are readily separated. You can readily recycle and regenerate them. They are long lived and they are cheaper. Whereas in case of homogeneous catalysis, what are the advantages? They are very high rates. They are robust to poisons. They are highly selective. They require mild conditions and mechanisms are often known. So ultimate goal is what? You have to combine the fast rates and high selectivities of homogeneous catalysis with the ease of recovery and recycle of heterogeneous catalysts. So any time you generate a catalyst, these are your goals. Basically, you need a fast rate, you need high selectivity, and it can be recovered uh, as easily as possible and recycled as many number of times as possible. So they, these are the uh, four points in which you are developing any materials which should be used for catalysts. So now what are the, there are different stages for heterogeneous catalysis or surface catalysis. So first is a diffusion stage, this is followed by a physisorption, then a chemisorption happens, then migration happens, reaction, desorption, diffusion. So if you look into it, so this is the stage one, you can see the diffusion is happening. Then you're having physisorption on the surface. After this, what you have is chemisorption where your chemical bonds are getting formed. You can see over here, the chemical bonds got formed. Then you have a surface diffusion as shown over here. And then you have the reaction which is happening and ultimately desorption. So your things are moving out and it is diffusing out. So these are the different steps of a heterogeneous catalyst reaction. And how this is happening? This is happening on these active sites which are there in all these pores. We say you now the porous material is a more number of active sites will be there if it's a porous material if it's having a higher surface area because it is a surface reaction. So for heterogeneous catalysis, you prefer having something which is having much more of a surface area. So what are the typical features? So metal or metal oxide, they are generally impregnated onto a support. This is how what we discussed. Typically, it can be the metal support can be silica or alumina. And you have three dimensional highly porous structures with a very high surface area. And these are the different stages which I have again shown over here. So uh, if you see heterogeneous acid-based catalyst is approximately 130 industrial processes they are using solid acid-based catalyst. Mainly found in petrochemicals production, uh, example for dehydration processes, condensation, alkylation, esterification, and most of these are acid catalyzed processes. Out of acid-based catalyst, again acid catalyzed processes are much more compared to the base catalyzed reactions. And almost 180 different kinds of catalysts are being employed. Out of this, 74 are nothing but zeolites, which we will discuss a little bit later. And out of which, uh, ZSM-5 is the largest group. And the second largest group are oxides of aluminium, silicon, titanium, and zirconium. So these are, when you talk about catalysts, these are mostly the main groups of catalysts which are being used in industrial processes. So what are zeolites? So these are crystalline inorganic polymer, which comprises of uh, silica and alumina tetrahedra, formerly derived from SiOH4, this is silicon hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide with metal ions balancing the negative charge. So you have different metal ions which is balancing the negative charge and you have these kind of uh, sodium, aluminum, uh, silicate and aluminates. So lattice consists of interconnected cage-like structures featuring a mixture of pore sizes depending upon the uh, ratio of aluminium, aluminium to silicon. And the counter cation is also employed, the level of hydration and synthetic condition, etc. So all this will determine what is going to be the pore size in your zeolite. So the hydrated nature of the zeolites allow them to behave as bronsted acids. So these are the typical ZSM5 I uh, have shown over you how it is looking from the top view and from the side view. So uh, silicon by aluminium, uh, they are, if it is silicon aluminium, it is given as this blue dots and oxygen is uh, shown by this uh, red dots over here. Cations we are not showing. So we are showing just the channel, you know, how the channels are looking from the top view and the side view. So zeolites are used in many different uh, 
um, industrial processes like the Asahi cyclohexanol process. So in a traditional synthesis, you see the temperature is around 225 degrees centigrade and you require a pressure of around 10 atmospheres. Whereas if you are using a zeolite catalyzed process, the same process, what you find is with 98% selectivity it is uh, uh, formed. And in this case, you are having a temperature which is as low as 100 degrees centigrade. So immediately your energy requirements get so much less. And so obviously this is a much greener way of synthesizing uh, your uh, this uh, cyclohexanol. Then uh, in toluene alkylization also you find application of this catalysis. So what have uh, of uh, this uh, uh, this uh, catalyst? What happens is if you are using this kind of acidic ZSM5 from uh, when you are actually um, um, forming xylene from this toluene, what happens is the channel will allow only paraxylene to emerge. And why paraxylene is important? Because for the synthesis of your uh, this uh, PET products, that is polyethylene ter terephthalate, what you need is nothing but paraxylene. You cannot have a mixture of all these different meta para uh, xylene. So what you need is only paraxylene. And when you are using this kind of catalyst, the channel, uh, the it allows only the passage of paraxylene, as is shown over here. So then we talked a lot about uh, acid catalysts. So now talking about base catalysts. So traditional synthesis of this 5 ethylene 2 norborine ENB uh, via vinyl norborine is a particular example. Why this uh, ENB is important? Because it is a key component of the rubber material EPDM, uh, EPDM which we call it. So the base used for the isomerization is typically a sodium potassium alloy in liquid ammonia. So ammonia is easily recycled. Metal recycling becomes a bit difficult. Sodium and potassium is very dangerous. It is much more reactive than either only sodium or uh, potassium. This alloy is definitely much more reactive than that. So definitely this process is a little bit, you know, tricky to handle. So how you get rid of, you know, this kind of thing? This is by using a Sumimoto process. And here the base catalyst which you are using is a heterogeneous catalyst which is composed of sodium and sodium hydroxide on alumina. So it has a very high activity. The catalyst is readily recycled and obviously it is much, much safer than the sodium potassium alloy base which you are using uh, for the synthesis of this ENB. So now understanding catalytic biomass conversion. Here we spoke about you know heterogeneous catalysis for different kinds of uh, product synthesis. But now what we are more interested in, that renewable energy. So catalytic biomass conversion. So you have to understand how this is done, understanding the chemistry of realistic biomass feedstocks. Biomass, you have to understand, is very complex and a very diverse feedstock. It is composed of various oxygenated polymers, minerals, and different other extractives. So now lignocellulosic biomass is solid, non-volatile material that contains up to 58% of oxygen. So this has to be removed via chemical transformation to avoid higher value products or fuels that are compatible with current infrastructure. So this 50% weight, 58% uh, of oxygen has to be removed from this lignocellulosic biomass. Furthermore, there are many minerals which are present in biomass and almost to the extra of 28% and you need strategies uh, to utilize and remove them during the biomass upgrading. So for that you have to uh, see, I mean, then, then designing catalysts for these kind of materials become challenging. More challenging why? Because there are several components which are present in biomass which can catalyze homogeneous side reactions. They alter the yield and selectivity as compared to the reaction in isolated or well-defined model compounds. So in the model compounds, you're taking only one kind of thing. In the biomass, you have so many mixtures. So there can be many side reactions, you know, which can, uh, and you are using a catalyst and it is also catalyzing the homogeneous side reaction. So obviously then, the product, then your entire thing becomes very counterproductive. Then components which can be present in biomass which inhibit the desired reaction by strongly binding to the active sites. So like minerals uh, which are present in the biomass, it can poison the zeolite catalyst. Uh, then organic acids in pyrolysis oil, it can inhibit the hydrogenation ability of the common catalyst. So all these things have to be considered. So uh, realistic biomass feedstocks also contain species that are present as structural or stereoisomers. So when glucose is dissolved in water, as an example, uh, you, you'll find you know, five different equilibrated isomers or tautomers. So these speciation depends on factors such as solvent composition and the reaction temperature. Now the speciation can affect their reactivity, like fructose is more easily dehydrated to 5-hydroxymethylfurpural, that is HMF, than the pyranose form, which is glucose. And as such, the conditions under which fructose is predominantly in the pyranose form leads to higher HMF selectivity. So thus the presence of a Lewis acid catalyst which facilitates the interconversion of these two isomers, it can improve the yields of HMF from glucose. 
So all these different small, small factors needs to be considered when you're designing a catalyst for biomass conversion. So how uh, the, the thought process is you need to have a chemocatalytic biorefinery and how is it going to work? So from this lignocellulose, which is found in the biomass, you will produce lignin. And lignin is such a thing, if you are extracting the lignin out, you can do a chemical conversion and you can get these kind of uh, productive chemicals like phenols, aromatics, dibasic acids and olefins. From the lignocellulose, you can do a catalytic hydrolysis and depolymerization. You will end up with cellulose and hemicellulose. And then you can have these different processes. So the cellulose and hemicellulose, you can do catalytic uh, conversion and you can get different biofuels. Or else you can have, you know, dehydration reactions giving to furfurals. You can have aqueous phase reforming where you will get biofuel and chemicals like hydrocarbon and biohydrogen. Whereas you can have fermentation processes of the cellulose and hemicellulose and it is going to give you alcohols like biofuels and other chemicals. So if you look into a petroleum refining versus, you know, biomass processing, how is it going to look for petroleum? You have this, you have fractional distillation, you are forming hydrocarbons. You can have this different oxidative oxygen addition steps and you get, and you get chemicals. You can have these different molecular weight and structure adjustment by cracking, alkylation, isomerizing processes and you will get gasoline, diesel, jet fuel and things like that. Whereas when you have a biomass, you have a pre-treatment, hydrolysis or processing, you will get these different platform molecules and from these platform molecules you can get your chemicals. Whereas if you are doing molecular weight adjustment and oxygen removal steps in that case over here, like, you know, the different stages, like for oxygen removal, you have dehydration, hydrogenation, decarbon or decarboxylation, hydrogenolysis process. For molecular weight adjustment, you have alcohol condensation, ketonization, oligomerization. So all these processes you do, ultimately you will get gasoline, diesel or jet fuel. So you can have, to, like you have petroleum refinery, you can also have a biomass refinery to generate these kind of fuels. So the idea is to go into the right side and minimize the use of the left side. So what are the common reactions involved in biomass processing? As you saw in the last slide, it is dehydration, hydrogenation and hydrodeoxygenation. So now if you are, you know, converting the C5 oligomers to the furfural, which is a very important chemical, in that case, you can have these different kinds of processes and you have many of these catalysts which are already being used. This is for conversion of your C5 oligomers to furfural. Then you can have different CC coupling reactions. So you have that molecular weight adjustment which I showed. So ketonization processes involve condensation of two carboxylic acid molecules to produce a larger symmetric ketone. And this reaction possesses great potential for catalytic upgrading of biomass since CC coupling takes place with simultaneous oxygen removal and you, as I told you that biomass, it contains more than 50% oxygen, you need to remove that oxygen. So the reaction involves the removal of carbon dioxide and water too from carboxylic acids, the latter of which are most common intermediates in case of biomass conversion processes. And this reaction is typically catalyzed by inorganic oxides such as ceria, like cerium oxides, titanium oxides, aluminium oxides, and zirconium oxides at a very moderate temperature. So these are the CC coupling reactions or molecular weight adjustment reactions uh, which you can have in case of biomass. So um, if you look into the different types of fuels like biofuels, alcohol derived fuels or pyrolytical oils, you are using them in the form of liquid. You can use them in this uh, internal conversion engines and the application can be in heavy duty vehicles, shipping and in the industrial applications. Then you can have biomass or non-recyclable -re -re recyclable wastes. In that case, these are all solids. And from this, basically, you can uh, generate heat and uh, gas and you can use it for generation of water vapor. With that, you can move that is steam and you can actually move a turbine. And you can have in applications, industrial applications, in aviation, in gas turbines, you can use it. And the other type of fuel is hydrogen, ammonia, syngas, or biogas. These are all gaseous. You can use it in fuel cells and you can use it for transport or you can also use it for power plants. So if you look into it, uh, how uh, the, the energy density of a fuel increase, hydrogen is of course the most energy dense fuel you have because you see the C by H ratio, the H by C ratio is increasing as you move from wood to coal to oil to natural gas to hydrogen. So then you can have these different catalysts which can be used, electrocatalyst as well as photocatalyst which can be used for you know all this water splitting kind of reactions, solar cells can be used, uh, that is uh, the photovoltaic cells can be used to generate electricity from the solar power. And then of course you can have various nanostructured catalysts 
And ultimately, what is the power package for the future, which is basically you have a hydrogen storage and ideal hydrogen storage. Uh, and how you will do it, you will have the water in, you will have an electrolyzer, it will give you hydrogen, you store the hydrogen, you pass on this hydrogen to your fuel cell, and ultimately water is going out. So this is a completely closed cycle and you have electrical power being generated. So it is an endless loop. And to get into this endless loop, in these different stages, you need different catalysts. And this is how the materials for catalysts are so important for our renewable energy or for a sustainable future. So now we spoke a little bit about We'll, we'll talk a little bit about electrocatalyst. So what is an electrocatalyst? We, right now we spoke about heterogeneous, homogeneous, different kinds of catalysts. Now we'll talk about what is an electrocatalyst. So first we have to define what is electrocatalyst. It is the relative ability of different substances when used as electrode surfaces under the same condition to accelerate a given electrochemical process. So you remember all the different electrochemical process we spoke about when we are talking about the batteries and uh, you know the supercapacitors and stuff like that. So electrocatalysts are a specific form of catalyst that function at electrode surface or may be the electrode surface itself. So electrocatalyst, it can be heterogeneous such as a platinum surface or nanoparticles or it can be homogeneous like a coordination complex or enzyme. So the electrocatalyst, it assists in transferring electrons between the electrode and reactants and facilitates an intermediate chemical transformation which is described by an overall half reaction. So redox reaction takes place. So there is a movement of electrons. So generally, uh, the most important thing what we want whenever we talk about production of hydrogen or production of renewable energy is water electrolysis. So generally, the overall reaction of water electrolysis, it can be divided into two half cell reactions. One is the hydrogen evolution reaction and the other is the oxygen evolution reaction, or which is in short form, which is known as HER or OER. So HER is the reaction where your water is reduced at the cathode to produce hydrogen and oxygen evolution reaction or OER is the reaction where water is oxidized at the anode to produce oxygen. So HER is basically this reaction where you have, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the potential is min minus 1.23 volts, whereas in case of OER what you have is basically um, uh, this for the anode and here uh, it is around 1.23 volt versus the uh, hydrogen electrode and in this case the delta g value is 237 kilojoules per mole it is positive so one of the critical barriers that keep water splitting from being of practical use is the sluggish reaction kinetics of oer and her due to a very high over potential or uh, over potential you know as i already have explained in the first lecture it's a measure of the kinetic energy barriers so catalysis, it will play a very major role in both OER as well as HER processes. So what is the performance evaluation index for electrocatalyst? So electrocatalyst water splitting is an uphill reaction as you can see over here. This is an uphill reaction as shown uh, because it has a positive value of delta G. But not only that, it also has to overcome a significant kinetic barrier. And Catalysts, they play a very crucial role in lowering this particular kinetic energy barrier. This is what it lowers. So water electrolysis normally it will require a higher potential than the thermodynamic potential which is 1.23 volts to overcome the kinetic barrier. The excess potential is also known as over potential which mainly is coming from intrinsic activation barriers which are present in the anode and cathode. So the over potential value corresponding to current density of 10 milliampere per centimeter square is used to compare the activities among the different catalysts. So there is a standard value. So this is basically compare, compared to the current density uh, of 10 milliampere per centimeter square. This is where you actually uh, compare the over potential of these different uh, electrocatalysts. So here one very important uh, point is there, that is the Tafel slope and the exchange current. Whenever you are talking about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, how to uh, assess the activity. Uh, so in that case, it is Tafel slope and exchange current, which uh, you have to study. So to assess the activity from the over potential versus your kinetic current relationship, this is the particular relationship we have where eta is your over potential and A plus B log J, J is nothing but your current density. So this Tafel slope is this B value. It is related to the catalytic reaction mechanism in terms of electron transfer kinetics. So a smaller Tafel slope, it means that there's significant current density increment as a function of the over potential change. So it has a faster electrocatalytic reaction kinetics. So the exchange current density, whatever I spoke about, that is a J, it describes the intrinsic charge transfer under equilibrium conditions. 
So higher exchange current density means a greater charge transfer rate at a lower reaction value. So a lower Teffel slope and a higher exchange current density, this is what you should be ideally looking for when you are developing an electrocatalyst routine. So your B value should be as less as possible, your J value should be uh, uh, as high as possible. So, uh, the, so the longer the tested current or the potential it remains constant, the better is the stability of the catalyst. So uh, this turnover frequency is a very important number when you talk about any catalyst. So it describes how many reactants can be converted to the desired product per catalytic site per unit time. And this TOF is a very important factor. This number has to be as high as possible uh, if you want to develop a good catalyst. So the definition of Faradic efficiency, when we talk about Faradic efficiency over here, it is the ratio of the experimentally detected quantity of hydrogen and oxygen to the theoretically calculated value of hydrogen or oxygen. So theoretical values you can calculate from uh, integration of the chronoampirometric or chronoprotentiometric analysis. The experimental values are measured by analyzing the gas production using the water gas displacement method or gas chromatography method. And then when you divide this, you will get nothing but your Faraday efficiency of the particular uh, catalyst. How much, I mean, you are theoretically have one value, but experimentally actually how much is being generated. So what are the different reaction steps in hydrogen evolution reaction? So this in the acidic medium, you can see these are the different steps where proton and electron is coming into the proton, you're getting the hydrogen which is absorbed. Then again, this hydrogen absorbed react with another proton and electron, you form hydrogen. Two of this hydrogen absorbed will give you the hydrogen evaluation. In case of alkaline medium, it is the other way around. The electron is getting added to water. You have an OH minus generated with hydrogen absorbed. And then again, the same process follows. So you over here, you have a OH minus and you have hydrogen evaluation. So now the effective uh, uh, effectivity or efficiency of a catalyst is generally uh, measured with the form of volcano plots. So this is your exchange current density versus the MH bond energy. So this is your exchange current intensity and this is your uh, metal hydrogen bond energy for each of the metal surface in case of an acidic media. So in this particular case, you see that you have different kinds of materials learning in the plot. In this volcano plot, you will find platinum and rhodium. Uh, rhodium. These are basically an iridium. They are occupying the highest position. When you're talking about acid med acidic medium, uh, generation of hydrogen using hydrogen evolution reaction, evolution reaction. Whereas when you are having an alkaline medium, so this exchange current density on monometallic surfaces versus the calculated um, bond energy of hydrogen with this metal surfaces. So in this particular case, you will find in the volcano plot, it is platinum, which is occupying the highest position over here. So the peak is where for platinum. So noble metal-based electrocatalyst and non-noble metal-based electrocatalyst, both are used for this hydrogen evolution reactions. For noble metal-based electrocatalyst, you mostly have platinum-based catalyst. Uh, so uh, these are, uh, because it is platinum-based and obviously the cost factor is very high. So in this case, what you have to do is you have to find out ways and means to use different other metals as catalyst and with a better performance so that you can bring down the cost. So if you alloy platinum with other low cost transition metal, it can improve the platinum utilization and the synergistic effect of the alloy, it can modify the electronic environments and improve the activity. Or you can couple the platinum with other water dissociation promoters. And this is another important strategy which improves the alkaline hydrogen evolution reaction uh, activities, which is very meaningful for industry for practical use. In case of non-noble metal-based uh, HER electrocatalyst, uh, mostly what you uh, use is low-cost and earth-abundant uh, materials. So you can have defect-rich uh, molybdenum sulfide, cobalt sulfide, you can have oxygenated molybdenum sulfide. So these kind of things you can use as a non-noble uh, metal-based HER electrocatalyst. Now coming to the different reaction steps, uh, that, that was for your um, hydrogen evolution reaction. That is what we discussed in the last two, three slides. Now coming to the different reaction steps which are there in the oxygen evolution reaction. So what are they? So you can have adsorbent evolution mechanism or uh, in short form which is known as AEM. So in this particular case what you have is basically OH- minus is reacting with this whatever this metal catalyst and you have this MOH with electron generation. Then this MOH will react with another OH- minus, as you can see over here. It will lead to the formation of this MO bond and it will throw out water and it will also give out a proton. In this case, what is going to happen? Again, this MO is going to react with an OH minus and you'll get MOOH. 
and then uh, uh, it will uh, decompose and give you 2m oxygen and two of the electrons. And again, this MOH, whatever was formed over here, it can react with another OH minus and it will again give you another oxygen and electron. So these are the different kinds of catalysts which you can use in case of OER in alkaline medium, which is shown the volcano plot you can see. In this case, it is ruthenium oxide, iridium oxide, platinum oxide and manganese oxide, which definitely is having, uh, you know, your highest uh, exchange uh, current rover potential. Uh, followed by this uh, delta H uh, value. So uh, then another important point is uh, 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 the electrocatalytic carbon dioxide reduction. That is another very important uh, uh, thing which is uh, finding a lot of impetus, a lot of research is being happening right now for electrocatalytic carbon dioxide reduction. So uh, how what, what, what it does, it produces an anth anthropogenic carbon cycle by converting the carbon dioxide in water into fuels and chemicals using solar or other forms of renewable energy. And this is a very appealing strategy to remove excess carbon dioxide. So the electrochemical conversion of carbon dioxide, it has several advantages because it has a mild reaction condition. You can have controllable reaction rates, good product selectivity through applied potential and wide scalability due to modular electrolyzer designs. So this is how, uh, I mean, where you, the electrocatalyst is going to find a lot of application. So what are the different stages of this particular uh, reaction? Uh, you can see over here how this particular reaction on the activation energy of this carbon dioxide molecule to form this CO2 dot minus radical anion. This is the first elementary electron transfer step in a carbon dioxide reduction reaction. But this you see it proceeds at a very negative applied potential, which is around minus 1.9 volt versus standard hydrogen electrode and that and that is at a non catalytic surface. So in the development of this electrocatalyst for carbon dioxide reduction reaction, it is very vital to lower the kinetic energy barriers and improve the energy efficiency. So this is where your catalytic uh, materials is going to come into picture when you are talking about CO2 RR or carbon dioxide reduction reactions. So now this electrocatalytic carbon dioxide reduction mechanisms, if you see, this is a very complicated multi-electron and multi-proton transfer process, okay? So uh, if you look into it, I mean, definitely you need not remember this, but this particular plot, I've, uh, this figure I have given away to show how challenging it is. There are as many as 16 products and it includes a wide range of alkanes, alkenes, aldehydes, ketones, alcohols, carboxylic acids. And uh, these are all formed when you are doing this carbon dioxide reduction reaction using a copper catalyst. So all these different products, they have been identified on the copper surface as well as in the solution. So what are the different catalyst design strategies? So let's look into that. So there are three different things which you have to consider because this is uh, advanced materials chemistry course. So we are trying to look into, you know, what are the different forms of materials you can have and then how you can design them, how you can use them and what is the final applicability of these particular materials. So for the carbon dioxide reduction reaction, three things you have to consider. One is the overpotential, the other is the selectivity and the other is the current density. So how these, how you can design the material so that all these three factors are taken care of. So how it is going to work? So for this uh, overpotential and selectivity, what you need is intermediate binding energy. So this binding energy is basically a factor of your electronic structure and how you can modify electronic structure in the material. You can generate vacancy, you can do alloying, you can use a single atom, you can use a phase junction, you can use different surface groups, you can do coating, doping. So all this is going to change your electronic structure. Now, the other point by which you can, uh, you know, do these, all this, uh, the, the change in the over potential selectivity and current density is via your catalytic side density. Catalytic side density is dependent on what? It is dependent on your geometric structure. So what are the different geometric structures you can form? You can form dendrites, you can form porous structures, you can have a rough surface to give you, you know, more surface area. You can do confinement, you can do it on a 3D substrate. Confinement means basically you are growing the material in a confined space. You can have a 3D substrate, you can do size reduction. So all this is going to, uh, give, you can do a manipulation of your geometric structure. And in between them, you know, using both of these techniques, what you can do is you can 
um, change the grain boundary, you can do a step and terrace kind of material, you can expose specific facets or sites, and you can do quantum confinement. So all these are the different catalyst design strategies. So they will change, you can play around with the electronic structure and the geometric structure, which will change your catalytic side density and the intermediate binding energies. And ultimately, all both of this is going to have an effect on the overpotential selectivity and current density of that particular catalytic material and will ultimately enhance the carbon dioxide reduction reaction. So these are the different catalyst design strategies. So now let's see what are the different kinds of electrocatalysts we can use. Uh, there, there are different ways of uh, carbon dioxide reduction. One is by producing formates or formic acid. Uh, so you can have three reaction pathways for carbon dioxide reduction to formate via different intermediates as you can see over here. So these are the reactions. It's difficult for me to read out but definitely when you look into this slide you will find out you know there are three different reaction pathways. And what you can do is you can plot this OCHO binding energy versus your exchange um, energy. And if, when you look into these different metal surfaces, whatever is uh, being used for carbon dioxide reduction reaction, you'll find that tin is occupying one of the topmost plot in the volcano plot. So if you look into the different uh, uh, materials, uh, then this uh, efficiency, if you see, then you'll find that uh, for uh, this tin-based material, the efficiency is definitely uh, quite high. Uh, though the potential, as you can see, is uh, not really, you know, that much, but uh, the, the efficiency of the transformation is definitely much higher in case of all this uh, tin-based alloy kind of material. Then you can have CO producing electrocatalyst that also helps uh, for the carbon dioxide reduction reaction. First was the formic acid, now it is the carbon monoxide. So there are two different pathways for it. So the reaction pathways for the formation of uh, this carbon monoxide is shown over here. In here, uh, in this B uh, diagram, what you have is the volcano plot using the COH binding energy as a descriptor for the CO partial current density at 0 0.9 volt versus your hydrogen electrode. Uh, so you have all this volcano plot over here and you can see over here for the CO producing, it is the gold which acts as a very good catalyst in this particular case, okay. Gold is a very important catalyst. As you can see over here, the efficiency you can see as well as the potential all these values matches in case of a gold based catalyst. So what are the essence of electrocatalyst design for CO2 reduction? So uh, when you are using it for production of formate or formic acid, tin, bismuth, palladium and the lead based materials, they can reach almost 100% Faradic efficiency. But the problem is that they require higher over potentials and they have low current density. So that is the problem. So obviously, you have to work around with these materials. So these materials are anyway established materials, but now you have to work around with these materials so that what you have is low over potential and a higher current density. For carbon monoxide production, what we saw is gold and silver based materials. They are the most active and the selective catalyst. So recently the single atom catalysts have been shown to have very high catalytic activity selectivity and stability for the electrocatalytic reduction of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. And for the production of highly reduced C1 and C2 plus products, copper based materials, they provide the base, best kind of catalyst. Uh, but you have to understand that even now, the best performing system, still it doesn't meet the requirement for industrial application. So these are all more or less, most of this uh, carbon dioxide reduction reaction catalyst, electrocatalyst, they are all in the lab design stage. None of that has gone through the industry as such. So what are the different design strategies as we saw that you can change the electronic structure and you can and you can also change the geometric structure. So the design strategies include reducing the size to nanoscale level, you expose specific facets, you can do quantum confinement, doping, allowing, defect engineering, all of these techniques have been developed to modify the electronic and geometric structure of the catalyst so that their performance for the carbon dioxide reduction reaction can be enhanced. But you have to understand that as of now, none of the catalysts have shown this much amount of promise which can be used for industrial applications. So the research is going on very actively in this particular area. Now coming to the last bit of the uh, lecture, which is your photocatalytic water splitting. So what is the process? So water is photocatalytic. Uh, so you what, what you have in this case is photon with an energy which is above 1.23 electron volt. 
So where the lambda is basically less than 1000 nanometer has to be absorbed. And in the step two, what is happening is photo excited electrons and holes, these are generated as you can see. So when you are having this light falling on this particular material, this is your light energy, it's falling on the particular material, you are generating a hole and you're generating an electron. This adsorbed species water is reduced and oxidized by these electrons and the holes. So ultimately what you have over here is oxygen generation and then you have the hydrogen generation. And this is all being done by a catalyst which is activated by light. And uh, the lambda of the light is, has to be less than 1000 nanometers. So what is the photocatalyst? So that is basically the definition. So now the, what is the photocatalyst material requirement? Over there we said around 1000 nanometer because it was around 1.23 volt which we saw. But the band gap, it has to be, so the band gap of this material, it has to be greater than 1.23 electron volts and should be sufficiently small to make efficient use of the solar spectrum. So in the solar spectrum, that band gap is less than 3 electron volts. So band levels has to be suitable for water splitting. So this is the band gap, what you see for, uh, the, the, for um, uh, production of oxygen from water, for production of hydrogen, again you have this thing. And so the conduction and the valence band should be adequately placed so that this particular reaction can take place. So uh, obviously uh, you need band levels which are suitable for water splitting. Then you need high crystallinity of the photocatalytic material because defects it acts as recombination sites and if the if your uh, electrons and holes whichever is generated they are recombining then obviously less amount is available for your uh, production of oxygen or production of hydrogen so obviously you have to see that defects are as minimum as possible so high crystallinity is very important then long term stability charge transfer used for water splitting and it is not corrosion so uh, what you have to see is that the material doesn't corrode and in fact it, it gives a very efficient charge transfer without corrosion. So the requirements for a photocatalyst to be viable on a large scale usage involves high quantum yield, uh, being very inexpensive, earthly abundant, it should be recyclable, it should be non-toxic, it should be resistant to corrosion, photostable and it must also have a very long lifetime. So again, coming to the photocatalyst material requirements, there are many materials which can be used as photocatalysts because their band gap obviously is higher than that of 1.23 electron volts, but many of them are not very efficient photocatalysts. Why? Because the placement of the bands, this is what you have to see. So wide band gap semiconductor, so you can take a very wide band gap semiconductor, you say, okay, fine, my band gap is much higher than that of 1.23 electron volts. But what is going to be the problem in that case? Like what you see in case of zirconium oxide, uh, and then you can have zinc sulfide. So in that case, what is going to happen? It can only use the light which is there in the ultraviolet region of your solar spectrum. So uh, this will result in a very low solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency because we know that the solar, uh, the the ultra, the UV component in solar radiation is only around uh, four percent or so. So obviously, I mean, you are using only four percent of the solar light which is falling on the on the particular material. So the efficiency is going to be very low. So mostly what we look for is something which is going to get activated under visible light, that is uh, the, the normal light, not the UV light. So visible radiation should activate it. In that case, you will get a much higher solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency. So mostly when you talk about photocatalytic material, you will find it is the D0 and the D10 based metal oxide. So among the D0, what you have, you have titanium 4 plus. So you have titania, you have strontium titanate, and you have K2, La2, Ti3, O10, these are for the titanium 4 plus. For zirconium 4 plus, you have zirconium oxide. Niobium 5 plus is also a D0 system. So for that, you have the strontium niobate and you have potassium niobate. Then tantalum 5 plus, you have all these lithium tantalate, sodium tantalate, potassium tantalate, or barium tantalates. Then tungsten, that is W6 plus. Then you have this uh, cesium, uh, rubidium cesium tungstate. Then you can, uh, sorry, rubidium ni uh, niobium tungstate or you can have rubidium niobium tungstate. So all these different kinds of metals. But here the central uh, transition metal ion is a DZ. Or else you find again very good photocatalysts are D10 group. So in D10 you have gallium 3 plus, you have indium 3 plus, you have germanium 4 plus, tin 4 plus, antimony 5 plus. So all these again are very good photocatalyst metal. Why so? Because in the D0 what you are having, in D0 case, uh, in, in, your, uh, uh, in your conduction band, 
uh, the thing is that the, D, uh, the, the, the there are no electrons in your uh, D level or in the D10 group again you have an empty S or P orbital which are your conduction bands whereas um, in case of the, uh, the oxides and the sulfides what you have is your balance band which is having uh, the P uh, the filled P orbitals so th that th this is a process basically which will help in the photocatalyst process so the D0 and the D10 D0 is having uh, empty D orbitals, whereas D10 is having empty S and P orbitals. So the, in your conduction band, you have this empty orbitals, so, and this actually helps. So uh, D0, uh, what is happening? You have layered perovskite with reaction sites between layers, and the band gap between this O2P and the D0 is usually too big. And the D10, in case what happens, the conduction band will have dispersed uh, S and P orbitals. It gives them a very high mobility, and it still usually has a very large band gap. So this is basically why the D0 and the D10 metal oxides are being used uh, mostly as photocatalytic materials. So what are the different photocatalyst development techniques? So hydrogen production by the photocatalytic water splitting, it is considered to be a very promising technology for green energy evolution. Titanium oxide, graphitic carbon nitride, cadmium sulfide, these are three widely studied catalysts for water splitting in the last few decades. And among them, titanium oxide is found to be more superior and it is a benchmark photocatalyst till now. From the since 1972, since the time Ijima actually uh, discovered this photocatalytic process, I think titanium oxide is one of the best materials for photocatalyst. So, uh, what are the different methods by which you can um, improve the photocatalytic properties? It is by doping, by forming heterojunction, by dye sensitization techniques. You can sensitize it also with noble metal loading. You can increase the photocatalytic active area, you can modify the surface, you can do nanostructuring, or you can modify it using different kinds of co-catalysts. So with this, uh, today I will come to an end with our lecture on catalytic kind of materials. So if you have any questions, you can please put forward it to me now. So in uh, today's lecture, what we have covered is basically your uh, different kinds of renewable energy sources. Then we talked about how catalysts uh, can help in conversion of these renewable energy sources for the production of different kinds of uh, uh, green energy. And uh, we spoke about heterogeneous catalysts. We spoke a lot about uh, the catalysts which are used for biomass uh, conversion. And uh, uh, then we uh, kind of moved on to electrocatalysts and we spoke about the HER and the OER and the different catalysts which can be used for the hydrogen evolution reaction and the oxygen evolution reaction. And uh, then we topped it up with photocatalytic uh, hydrogen production. So this is in a nutshell what we covered in the last 70-75 uh, minutes. So kindly go through all these uh, lecture slides. If you have any doubts, uh, you can always call me or you can mail me. And uh, the assignments will be sent to you by the course coordinator. So please complete your assignments on time. And uh, then if there are no further questions, then a very good evening to you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.